Please turn me in God's Word now to uh, Psalm 90. We're continuing our meditation on uh, the attributes of God as we confess in Belgian Confession Article 1. And uh, we'll consider uh, three more attributes this afternoon. That God is eternal, incomprehensible, and invisible. And uh, to begin with, we'll read from God's Word from Psalm 90. A psalm which in particular especially highlights uh, the eternality of God and uh, contrasts it also with the uh, frailty and temporalness of man. So Psalm 90, let's uh, give our attention now to God's holy, inerrant, and inspired Word. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, You have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever You had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, You are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O children of man. For a thousand years in Your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. You sweep them away as with a flood. They are like a dream like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed. In the evening it fades and withers. For we are brought to an end by your anger. By your wrath we are dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They're soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. This is God's holy word. May bless it to our hearts this afternoon. And Please turn to me in the Belgian Confession of Faith. Now, Article 1, we'll read this once again. It's uh, page 153 in the Forms and Prayers book, and also page 855 in the Song book. And I'll, I'll read it, and you can just follow along. Article 1, The Only God... We all believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that there is a single and simple spiritual being whom we call God, eternal, incomprehensible, invisible, unchangeable, infinite, almighty, completely wise, just, and good, and the overflowing source of all good. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, in his uh, book, The Christian Faith, a systematic theology for pilgrims on the way, Dr. Michael Horton writes that theology exists for this very purpose, to appeal to the God who has revealed himself and his redemptive purposes in Christ so that he may be invoked in trouble, praised in deliverance, and obeyed in gratitude. That is the purpose of theology, and it's immensely practical. All of God's revelation of Himself is practical. And as we continue this afternoon in studying the attributes of God, remember that when we study the doctrine of God, it's so that when we, so that we might rightly call upon the one true God in worship and uh, call upon the one true God when we are in trouble and rightly praise Him when He delivers us and rightly obey Him in thankfulness. And uh, with these things in mind, let's turn our attention to the attributes of God once again. And when we speak of the attributes of God, it's common for theologians to speak of God's uh, incommunicable attributes and His communicable attributes. Now let me explain what that 
means. Uh, His incommunicable attributes are those attributes which he does not share with his creatures. Uh, So, for example, uh, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. We are not. Uh, He is immutable, which means unchanging. We're not immutable. Uh, And He's self-existent. We're not self-existent. He's immortal. We're not immortal in and of ourselves. He's invisible. We're not. And so, incommunicable means not shared. Uh, These are those attributes that He does not share with His creatures. Um, But then also there's His communicable attributes uh, that can be said to be shared with humans. Although in an analogical way, we would say. So there's not a one to, there's not a uh, it's not there's not an overlap, if you will, in the divine essence with with us. Uh, we have these attributes, but in a quali- qualitatively different way, because we are creatures, and He is the Creator. So, for example, God has knowledge, and man has knowledge, but God is all knowing, and His knowledge is qualitatively different than ours. It's it's an immediate. Knowledge, whereas man's knowledge is limited and derivative. Man has to reason from one thing to the next, but God just simply knows all things concerning himself and the world that he created immediately. And so, even when we talk about the communicable attributes, we have to realize that there is still a, this creator creature distinction that exists. Humans can love, but God is love. Humans can exercise justice, but God is just. And so we're always going to be qualitatively distinct from God as creatures. And yet we can still learn about God and live in a relationship with Him because He has condescended to us in His revelation. He's revealed Himself to us in His works of creation and providence and redemption. And supremely in the person and work of His Son, Jesus Christ. And so let's consider briefly this afternoon three of His incommunicable attributes Uh, Namely, that God is eternal, He is incomprehensible, and He's invisible. First, we confess that God is eternal based on His Word. Uh, When we speak of God's eternality, we're speaking of the fact that He transcends time. Uh, To put it negatively, God is not limited by time. He has no beginning, no middle, and no end to His existence. To put it positively, this means that our God exists in one indivisible present. He eternally exists. The best way to speak of God's existence is to simply say that God is. This is how He revealed Himself to Moses at the burning bush, right? His name is I Am. Tell the Pharaoh that I Am sent you. And so throughout the Bible, we worship God for His eternality. Uh, Here are some Scripture passages on which we base this confession. Isaiah 40 says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the Creator of the ends of the earth. Deuteronomy 33 says that the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Isn't that comforting? Or as we heard in our greetings from Revelation 1 at the beginning of the service, He is the God who is and who was and who is to come. Now, if you have a hard time wrapping your brain around all this, don't feel bad because it's something we can't fully grasp, our finite brains. If we knew exactly what eternity is, we would be eternal. We can't fully grasp this. In other words, we would be God if we could understand eternity. But we're not God, and yet God reveals Himself in a way that we can know Him as creatures and worship Him as our eternal God. So this is the God who we worship. We invoke His eternal name. We worship the God who transcends time. And because He transcends time, it means that God has no beginning He's called the Ancient of Days in Daniel 7. 
But even this is accommodated language for our finite minds to grasp, right? Because technically God isn't young or old or ancient. Those are all terms that are relative to time and are, are more technically appropriate to time-bound creatures, but not to the eternal God. But God uses this title, the Ancient of Days, to describe Himself to us in order to help us know Him as finite creatures. And it's meant to press home the point to us that God contains in Himself all times and ages, though He Himself is not bound by any times or ages. And just as no one brought God into being, for He is the God who has no beginning, so also no one can take God's life from Him, for He's the God who has no end. Psalm 9 says the Lord sits enthroned forever. Revelation 4 says, And wherever, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, to the 24 elders, the 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are You, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For You created all things, and by Your will they existed and were created. So to confess that God is eternal means He has no beginning and He has no end. And it also means to confess that He has no succession of moments. He doesn't experience events moment by moment like we do. He doesn't experience the past, present, and future like we do. He experiences it all at once, which makes no sense to us because that's not how we exist, right? I mean, just think about uh, how we experience moments in time, right? You go to a football game and, and you, you go and you, you, know, you get to your seat early, hopefully, and uh, get your food ready to go and you watch the game and you experience the, you know, the thrill of, you know, your team getting ahead and then getting behind and, and then, and then uh, go to the next quarter and you experience it quarter by quarter, then there's a halftime and uh, you talk to some other time-bound creatures at halftime about the game, right? And then eventually you get through it, right? But it takes time and it, there's this successive moments in time that you experience. God doesn't experience that like we do. He experiences it all at once. He sees all things at once. He knows all things at once. He doesn't increase in knowledge or wisdom. He's infinitely wise and all-knowing. He's unchangeable in His nature. He's the one eternal God, the great I Am. And He's the one who declares the end from the beginning. Isaiah 46 says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like Me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from a far country. I have spoken, and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed, and I will do it. The amazing thing about God is that although He transcends time, He creates time for us. God has created time for us, you see. In the words of the Reformed theologian Erman Bavink, time is, if there were, he says, if there were no creatures, there would be no time. Time didn't exist before Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. And even more, God freely enters into time and space without being bound or contained within either. As a person put it, it is precisely because God transcends time that He can be our dwelling place in all of our times. And this is what brings comfort to God's people in Psalm 90, which you just read a moment ago. It's, it's interesting that book three of the Psalms is the darkest of the five books of the Psalms, and it ends on a rather dark and depressing note with uh, Psalm 88 and parts of Psalm 89. Both are laments that most likely reflected the experience of Israel when they were in exile. And Psalm 89 ends with the words, Remember, O Lord, how your servants are mocked, and how I bear in my heart the insults of all the many nations with which your enemies mock, O Lord, with which they mock the footsteps of your anointed. So you see, God's people feel in this moment as if God has forgotten them. But what is it then that comforts them at the beginning of book four of the Psalms, which begins with Psalm 90? 
What comforts them is, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And so it brings them great comfort as these time-bound creatures know that, that he is their God throughout every generation. He does not change. He's always there as God. And so this is what it means to confess that God is eternal. But we also confess then that God is incomprehensible. He's incomprehensible. That means that we cannot fully understand Him and know all His ways. Now, we might ask, can God be known at all? Well, the answer is yes and no. (laughs) Yes, God can be known, but only insofar as He reveals Himself to us. And no, He cannot be known fully and perfectly. Uh, The incomprehensibility of God is taught in several places, explicitly in God's Word, as well as it can be deduced in various places. But here's a few verses on the incomprehensibility of God. Job 11 says, Can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol. What can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than than the sea. Psalm 145 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. Uh, Psalm 147 says, Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. One of the things I love about those psalms is often when you read them, they not only highlight this just amazing incomprehensibility of God and His greatness, but also His goodness. In that same psalm that says, great is our Lord and abundant in power, His understanding is beyond measure, it also says, the Lord builds up Jerusalem, He gathers the outcasts of Israel, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. This is how great and good our God is. And so God is incomprehensible. We can't fully know God in His essence or in all of His glory. We might say it's above our pay grade, as it were. We can only know that which He has revealed to us. And even His revelation to us is accommodated to us as creatures. Uh, John Calvin once said that when God speaks to us, it's as if He speaks baby talk to us. Right? That's how we... We talk to little ones, you know, like little two-year-olds, 18 months old or whatever, in a way that they can understand. If we talk to them like we talk to adults, they just wouldn't understand a thing (laughs) we're saying, right? And there's certain things that even as children get older that parents are very sensitive to how they explain it to their children because it would just destroy them, right, if they explain certain things at an adult level. And in a far greater way, when God speaks to us, it's like baby talk. It's an accommodated, it's accommodated speech. It's analogical speech for us finite creatures. And so, you know, we read things in the Scripture like God saved Israel with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Now, does that mean that God literally has arms and hands? No. Again, see, it's analogical speech. But if we are to know anything of God, He has to speak to us in a way that makes sense to us as creatures. Otherwise, we could never know anything about God. Now, why does it matter that God is incomprehensible? Just some practical implications of this. Well, it matters because if God was comprehensible, He wouldn't be worthy of our worship. But God is incomprehensible, and so we worship Him. And as Paul goes on to praise Him in Romans 11. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. We praise Him for that. If you could know all His ways, you'd be God. It's good to remember these things, you know, when we go through suffering, when we go through unanswered prayer and we struggle and wrestle with that. We have to remember God is infinitely wise. He knows all things. 
His ways are incomprehensible, but He's also good, and we've got to trust Him. We've got to trust Him. You know, when we struggle with unanswered prayer, it's always good to remember that He always answers our prayers in the way that we would want Him to answer it if we knew everything that He knows. So it matters because He's only worthy of our worship if He's incomprehensible. It also matters because if God was comprehensible, we would just get bored with God. (laughs) Right? I mean, as the saying goes, familiarity breeds contempt. We tend to not be too impressed with someone who is easy to figure out and that we know all too well. Granted, in part, this saying has some truth to it because of our our sin nature, but once we know something so well, we do tend to get bored with it and, and want to move on to something new and interesting, right? But with God, we will never get bored with knowing Him because we will never fully know Him. That's why it's always going to be glorious to know Him in, throughout all of eternity. We're never going to get bored growing in the knowledge of God. As uh, Jen Wilkin puts it in her book, None Like Him, one day we will see God more clearly than earthly reason now allows and more extensively than His works and words currently reveal Him. Though now we know in part, one day we will know fully, even as we have been fully known. We will still be finite creatures seeking to comprehend the infinite But we will at last be able to see Him without the murkiness of sin blurring our vision. We will have eternity to progressively explore His perfections. And because to know Him is to love Him, our ever-expanding vision will elicit ever-expanding love. Like a Christmas morning with always another present to unwrap, eternity will increasingly disclose His hidden glories to the eyes of our hearts. And until then, let us pursue with eagerness what we can know of Him in this life. You see, we'll always enjoy getting to know God more and more. And now we know in part as creature, finite creatures and sinful creatures. Then we won't be sinful anymore. We'll be free from sin, but we'll still be finite, right? And so we're not going to have comprehensible knowledge of Him even in heaven. It won't be a sinful knowledge. It'll be a sinless knowledge, but we'll continue to grow in delight in knowing Him. And how can we grow in the knowledge of God in this life now? You see, if we long for that day of heaven when we'll dwell with Him forever and get to know Him more and more without sin, how much more should we strive to know Him even more now? And where do we know God? Well, we'll consider this more fully in the next article of the Belgian Confession, but we know Him in two books. The book of creation and the book of His Word, the book of general revelation and special revelation. And so if you want to know God more and more, we need to study His general revelation, study His glory and creation. You know, as the seasons change, thankfully the snow is melting away and things are getting uh, great to go for a walk. Go for a walk and enjoy the beautiful creation of God and get to know Him in His glory that's revealed in creation. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims His handiwork. But even more, He makes Himself more clearly and fully known to us in His Word. And so, how much more should we spend time meditating on His Word? And haven't you noticed that sometimes you read the same thing, you've read it before, but there's always new things you see there in God's Word that you didn't see before. Or there's new applications, deeper meaning. We will never exhaust the glories of getting to know God. But God is incomprehensible, and He's also eternal as we've seen. But finally, God is invisible. Uh, This attribute is very similar to what we spoke of last week when we confessed that God is spirit. Uh, It's also closely related to the incomprehensibility of God. Although we can know God, we cannot see and know God in His essence because He is invisible. John 1.18 and 1 John 4.12 says that no one has ever seen God. And what that means is that no one has ever seen God in His essence. Now you might be thinking, what about the time when Moses saw God's backside? Or what about Isaiah saying that he saw the King of glory? 
Or what about Paul seeing heaven? Uh, again, Hermann Bavink writes about this and says, every vision of God presupposes a divine condescension, a revelation by means of which God descends to our level and makes Himself known to us. And so when the saints of old said that they saw God, they were not seeing Him in His essence, but in a form suited to their capacity. This is what theologians call a theophany. A revelation of God in the likeness of a man, an angel, or any other created form. Now the fullest revelation of God that we can behold with our eyes is Jesus. In the same breath, John says in John 1, no one has ever seen God, the only God. I'm sorry, let me say that again. No one has ever seen God. And then he says, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him known. And just before that, he says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, Jesus is the fullest revelation of God that we can behold with our eyes. And even then, we're not seeing God in all His essence, but we're seeing God in the flesh, in Jesus, full of grace and truth. He's the image of the invisible God, Paul says in Colossians. He's the image of the invisible God. And and what this means is that when we get to heaven, we're going to see God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now we walk by faith, but then we will walk by sight. But see, a lot of people think that when they get to heaven, they're going to see Jesus and praise Him, but then say, okay, now can I see the Father? As if He's going to like step aside and say, now let me show you the Father. But that's not how it is. Remember, that's what Philip, that was Philip's error, right? In John 14, he says, Jesus, show us the Father and it is enough for us. And Jesus says, Philip... Have you not been paying attention? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. Jesus is the the fullest revelation of God that we can behold with with our eyes. Jesus is the beatific vision. Seeing Him face to face when He returns will be our greatest delight. And in seeing Him, we're seeing the Father and we're also experiencing the Holy Spirit as He points us and spotlights Jesus for us. And so, Paul says again in Colossians 1 that He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. And He's before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He's the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, He has now reconciled in His body of flesh by His death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before Him. You see, Jesus is God. He's fully God. And the amazing thing is the glorious mystery of the incarnation. Again, we can't fully grasp, but what an amazing truth that the eternal Son of God, who is the incomprehensible God, invisible God, added a human nature. And He entered into this world. According to His human nature, He became bound by time. He spent nine months in a womb. And He grew up. He aged. He had birthdays, maybe even birthday parties, children. He experienced the succession of time that we experience. 
of the things that we read about in Psalm 90 were true of Him. Where it says, for all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. He experienced God's just wrath through the sufferings that He faced all of His life and supremely on the cross. But He suffered God's wrath in our place. He suffered for our sins. Verse 12 of Psalm 90 is true of Him. So it teaches to number our days. His days were numbered. This is the eternal God in the flesh. And now, he's to be acknowledged as we confess in the definition of Chalcedon. That Jesus is to be acknowledged as one person with two natures, true God and true man, without confusion, without change, but also without division or separation. So his, in the incarnation, his divine nature didn't change at all. He is both eternally God and a time-bound creature according to his human nature. He's both incomprehensible according to his divine nature, but comprehensible according to his human nature and so forth. This is the wonderful, amazing truth of the incarnation that we adore at Christmas time. And the amazing thing is that he came into this world to save us from our sins and to reconcile us to the Father, to make known the Father to us that we might know God's grace and mercy through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so let us worship God in Christ. Let us adore Christ. Let us praise God for the gift of His Son. And uh, let us grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so to Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word and we can hardly take it in how amazing and glorious You are in Your incommunicable attributes. But we worship You and we stand in awe of You and we bow down before You and we praise Your name. You are the eternal God. and You are our dwelling place throughout all generations. You are our rock of refuge. You are the one in whom we depend, who never changes. And we thank You that You have revealed Yourself to us, not only as our Creator, but even more as our Redeemer in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And Father, we thank You for the gift of Your Son. And Jesus, we thank You for adding a true human nature forever so that we might know You and know the Father. And we thank You, Holy Spirit, for opening our hearts and revealing to us Christ and all His glory, full of grace and truth. And we pray that we would magnify and worship You, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as You've revealed Yourself to us in Your Word, and that we would find great comfort and hope in You as we look to You and call upon You whenever we're in trouble. Help us to know for sure that You are a great and good God because we see that so clearly revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ and in His resurrection. And we look forward to the return of Christ and that beatific vision where we'll see Him face to face and be like Him and worship forever and ever with the people of God from every tongue and tribe and language and nation. We pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.